Welcome back to Liberty Bites on the Think Liberty Network. I'm your host, William Gadsden. You can follow me personally on Twitter at William underscore Gadsden, or check out my Facebook page at William Gadsden Political Commentator. Check out Think Liberty on Facebook, Twitter, or whatever your favorite social media outlet is. Give us a follow and a like for updates on new episodes and more. All right, so if you're anything like me, you have this hunger for knowledge and learning, something that you can never really fully put a hold on. I listen to podcasts and interviews while I'm at the gym or have political commentary shows playing in the kitchen while I cook or the garage while I'm working on a project. But in today's political environment, it's hard to find someone else that is openly like that and willing to discuss things with you. Most people either believe that they have already figured things out or they believe something opposite of you and aren't interested in having their views challenged or even discussed. Thankfully, I got to have a long conversation with a young man. I, I say young man like I'm an old guy. I'm, I'm 29. But I talked with this guy for a couple hours, and I could see the same kind of hunger in him. His questions were pointed and genuine. He wanted to know what I thought about a variety of topics, and it was really, really refreshing to me to see. But in the course of this conversation, we started talking about philosophy, and an idea that I've been rolling around in my mind for a while now started cementing itself. That idea is that we can draw a direct corollary line between Enlightenment-era philosophers and today's two prevailing political philosophies. And I don't mean in the sense that this philosophy grew out of this other one, but now it's something else, or there's overlap, or that they're similar. I mean these original philosophies from over 200 years ago have acted as the bedrock for philosophical building blocks to come. And you can see the distinct line of thought from these original philosophies today. So before we dive into all of the details of that particular idea, we have to explore another big picture idea that I've been coming across recently, courtesy of Dr. Thomas Sowell. As I've mentioned before, I've been absolutely devouring Dr. Sowell's work over the last few months, and it's opening my mind to a lot of ways of thinking and, and truths themselves that I had never considered before. All of it backed by hard, empirical evidence. But the main idea of one particular book, The Vision of the Anointed, really grabbed my attention. So, if the warring philosophies of the Enlightenment period are the bedrock, Sowell's Vision of the Anointed is the capstone. To avoid getting too far ahead of myself, let's go ahead and outline these different philosophies, and I'll tie it all together with a nice little bow at the end. At the risk of reiterating too much, as I've talked at length about both of these philosophical schools before, this is going to come down to two different sides. Jean-Jacques Rousseau on one side, and Thomas Hobbes and John Locke on the other. During the Enlightenment period, the big topic of discussion was the nature of man. What is man like in a state of nature? From this fundamental question would spring very different ideas on government and society as a whole, but this was the basis for these different philosophical schools of thought. On the other side, <clears throat> excuse me, on the one side, Rousseau argued that the nature of man is good and peaceful and wonderful. It is society, he argued, that makes them brutish and violent and distrustful. Society corrupts the otherwise noble nature of man. Therefore, society must be torn down and rebuilt from scratch whenever man starts giving into these evil temptations and allows himself to be corrupted. On the other side, Hobbes and later Locke argued the exact opposite, that as far as the nature of man was concerned, he was naturally distrustful, violent, brutish, really more animalistic than man. Now, while Hobbes and Locke differ on how to go about addressing that basic nature of man, they agreed that society civilizes the baser instincts of man. It suppresses that nature. So society is necessary to lift man out of his state of nature. The philosophies of these men obviously get far more complex, but for the sake of this episode... These simplistic explanations are really what is important for my point. Now, on the modern side of this lineage, Dr. Sowell outlines the vision of the anointed and the vision of the benighted. 
Now, to be clear, this paradigm isn't a new idea, but I've never seen it so clearly defined and thoroughly explained as I have in Dr. Sowell's book. In it, he outlines two completely different worldviews, not political or ideological points of view, but entire worldviews. On the one hand, the vision of the anointed is, is that society can be perfected, that if we try the right combination of things, policies and laws, then we can fully eliminate things like racism, injustice, poverty, etc. Perhaps more importantly, the anointed believe that these are th- such things, there are such things as solutions, policies or responses to societal issues that have results without inherent cost. That while there are results, certainly, that there is no cost inherent in that policy decision or societal change, especially if the results are what they would deem to be good. Furthermore, they are the anointed, given by some cosmic or natural force the ability and intellect to carry these things out, and that if someone disagrees with them, well, then clearly... Those people aren't anointed like they are. They're inferior and should be pitied at best and put down at worst. The benighted, on the other hand, understand that society is naturally imperfect and that it can never be made perfect, no matter how hard we try. They also believe that any policy decision, indeed any decision at all from the level of the individual to the level of society, has implicit cost or as Sowell calls them, trade-offs. After all, resources of any kind, whether you're talking about material resources, energy, or time itself, are all finite. So when making these decisions, it is better to make informed decisions, understanding and weighing the costs and potential outcomes, excuse me, potential unintended outcomes involved. Now, obviously, we can see a rough correlation between these two sides in the left and the right, but I would take that a step further and say that it's between authoritarianism and liberty. The two visions certainly aren't exclusive to one side or the other. There have been, on the whole, benevolent, liberty-minded, democratic leaders like JFK. There have been, on the whole, more authoritarian-minded Republican leaders like George W. Bush. The arrogance that we often see on the left also isn't exclusive to them. We have spent decades involved in Middle Eastern wars believing that if we spend enough money or surge in enough troops, that we can get the people in that country to adopt Western democracy and values, ideas that are completely foreign to them. But we know what's best, so it's okay. And much of that has been driven by folks on the right. But I digress. Let's tie all of these different ideas together. So ultimately, this all goes back to the debate over the nature of man. If you're a Rousseauian, you believe that the nature of man is good. Therefore, it is possible for man to make flawless, costless decisions, i.e. solutions. If man can make solutions rather than trade-offs, then a perfect society is possible. If a perfect society is possible then we just need to make the right decisions in the right time and in the right order to achieve this perfect society. To eliminate the evils of man entirely, because in Rousseauian philosophy, this is possible. This is the vision of the anointed. But Hobbes and Locke believe that the nature of man is distrustful, violent, brutish. Therefore, it is not possible for man to make flawless, costless decisions. Man can only make trade-offs. A perfect society is not possible, but by making informed decisions when creating policy or affecting societal changes, the evils of man can be mitigated, not eliminated because the nature of man ensures that it will always exist on some level, but mitigated. This is the vision of the benighted. In these ways, those that side with authoritarianism and those that side with liberty are children of Rousseau and the children of Hobbes and Locke, probably the only time many of those on the right would happily claim to have two daddies. Now, as Hayek points out in The Fatal Conceit, 
if the foundation of an ideology is flawed, then everything that comes after it will be flawed as well. We see this all too clearly in the children of Rousseau. In many ways, Rousseau's philosophy wasn't just the birth of the vision of the anointed. It was the birth of collectivism, of socialism, Marxism, and communism in all of its forms. On the other hand, the children of Hobbes and Locke give us modern democracies, republics, and things like the U.S. Constitution. We have seen the fruit that both sides bear, but in order to do so, we have to begin by being honest with the kind of seed that was planted to produce that fruit in the first place. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join me next week to become more liberty-centered with us. I'm William Gadsden with Think Liberty. Think Liberty.